Welcome to I Change the Narrative, a podcast for and about Black men inspiring, supporting, and empowering Black men and Black boys. Today's guests will be sharing their expertise on building Black generational wealth. Before we start the conversation, I want our guests to tell us about yourself and the work that you're involved in that lends itself to the topic or the lived experience. We're going to start with Dr. Rick. Welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. First of all, uh, thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I've been in this battle for 35 years. Um, my area of expertise in the field of psychology and performance psychology and in the area of trauma healing. Uh, but I've done a great deal of research um, behind uh, wealth building. I've uh, had the uh, wonderful experience of traveling this journey for 30 years, the ups and the downs. Uh, learning the difference between assets and liabilities, learning the difference between building riches and building wealth. Um, I've, like I said, I've been up, been down, been back up. Uh, but the things that I'm learning, that I've learned, I've shared, uh, as I told you earlier, this is book number 25, um, The War on Black Wealth. Um, and it focuses on, the first half of it focuses on uh, the things that have been used against us to keep us at bay for years. The second part of it are ways that we can overcome it. Uh, I developed the Legacy Wealth Academy roughly seven years ago, and we are launching our first online course uh, starting Monday. So I'm excited about that. But I hope to add something to it. This is a conversation that we are lo it's long overdue. I'll just put it that way. Um, and so I'm excited to have this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Rick. John. Hi, my name is John Cook, the owner of Premier Credit Builder, where we help people build generational wealth by going through credit and help them build businesses. I'm excited about this conversation too. I'm in the, the stages of laying the foundation for me and my family to build generational wealth. Awesome. Thank you. Words and wisdom change outcomes. So I thank you for being a part of that today, gentlemen. Um, this episode of I Change a Narrative is powered by So Organic, So Suave, also known as Sauce. Sauce is a luxury hair care and skin care refuge for those with thick hair and melanin-rich skin. From healthy beard growth to top of head hair styling to an illuminating skin care regimen, Sauce Essentials will naturally enhance your outer appearance to strengthen your inner confidence. Sauce invites you to accept the authenticity and real self-care and embrace your best. You can find Sauce's award-winning grooming essentials online at sossd.co. Again, that's sossd.co. You can also follow Sauce on Instagram and for the latest in product news and updates at sossd.co. Elevate your grooming with Sauce today. Gentlemen, planning for the future is more than establishing a savings account and creating a budget for you and your family. It's also about thinking how investments, ownership, entrepreneurship, and managing long-term debt, debt affects the financial security of future familial generations. So in the Black community, building generational wealth isn't, hasn't been easy to either attain or maintain for multiple factors. Once um, I looked at this subject as, um, oh, I can handle this subject. But once I delved more into this subject, I was like uh, very scared um, as many are. Um, so gentlemen, let's get started with this very scary um, subject. And I say scary, it's because it's a lot to it and we don't always want to um, address the different factors um, into generational wealth. So let's get started. How would you all define generational wealth? Because I noticed that many have, um, our community have misdefined mis this word. Okay. You want to take it or you want me to? I'll go first. Um, okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I kind of look at it as you're leaving a legacy. And part of that legacy is not just um, it's not just what you're you're leaving here. It's, it's, it's about what you build with the your family. 
So when you're leaving this legacy, you're leaving a plan, a structure for future generations to follow, to get to the successful part that you're trying to, to be at. I think that like, um, just look at my case, I know I'm at the foundation part of building for my children. And I'm thinking about my grandchildren that you not here yet. So I think that it's about what is your legacy going to be and how do you view that? Absolutely. Right. I think uh, in order for clarity, discussions and conversations need clarity. And I think definitions are important. So I'm glad we start here. Uh, for me, uh, when I'm talking to people or I'm teaching on a topic, it's uh, the simplified version is simply the bequeathment of assets mm -hmm. that have the uh, not only the assets, but the structure through which the assets would be uh, projected beyond the first generation. So I'm not just leaving kids, my kids money. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving them assets with a structure in place for the next generation behind them. A primary example real quickly, and we'll, we can move on, is everybody knows about the Rock Rockefellers, but very few people understand how John Rockefeller actually projected his wealth. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he was in the right place at the right time. If you understand how things work, it wasn't just his mind. He happened to be born at a time that he came into his adult maturity during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So he was just at the right time, at the right moment, and had the right mindset, which is a big mm -hmm. part of wealth building. But what he did is he built trust. Now, these trusts were unbelievable. You cannot project wealth effectively beyond the first uh, subsequent generation without a trust because I can leave it to my kids and they can squander it. Yeah. If I set up the trust and he did it unbelievably ingenious way, he, he set up what I call a duality trust. So the trust is left to the kids, but only they, they only get half. Mm -hmm. The other half is projected to the second kid. But in order for his for his grandkids, but in order for his kids to get it, they have to build a trust that they commit to that their kids also get. So they get one trust. Their kids get two. Each generation has to do the same thing. So every subsequent generation gets more trust uh, contributed than the first generation. Mm -hmm. And the trust control it. So the trust isn't controlled by one individual. It's controlled by a board. So it's it's determined how that money is going to be moved about. So you can't squander it. It's going to be passed down. And so that's just one way. But it's the bequeathment of that. It, and uh, the one thing John said that I want to commend him for for two things I want to commend him for. Number one, you're at the foundation. That's the beginning part. That's so important uh, that you understand that you are the progenitor of this unbelievable thing that's about to take place. And it's how you teach them. It's what you give them. It's what they see you do. And it's the structure through which you do it. But also, one of the biggest things that we lose when we start talking about wealth is the power of ownership. You started a business. Do you know how much of my wealth is hidden in my business? I don't have a whole lot of cash. You know why? We live in America. The U.S. dollar is a fiat currency. It's not backed by anything. The volatility that is impacting that currency tells me that it's depreciating at an alarming rate. And eventually it's virtually worth nothing now. But because of the drive of the consumerism in this country, it's driven by debt. We live in a debt based economy. Right. right. So. That's where you come in with your credit business because we live in a debt based economy. Everything is about driving you to spend more money than you earn. Mm -hmm. It's not that you spend. It's that I got to go get some of this on credit. We hear all the time about one point four trillion in buying power. Right. So what the average black person here is we got as black people, we're the ninth wealthiest nation on, mm -hmm. the, on the planet. And what you don't understand is it's a play on words and they know you're not going to examine it. There's a difference between 1.4 trillion in wealth and 1.4 trillion in buying power. The vast mm -hmm. majority of that buying power is what? Credit. Yeah. So in order for you to spend that 1.4 trillion, you're going to go in debt. The number one enemy of wealth is what? Debt. Mm -hmm. So you, you, we, you, know, you can just go on and on, but I commend you because when you build a company, you're investing in something, number one, that you can pass down. Yeah. Can't pass a job down. Nothing wrong with having a job. Okay. But you should also have a plan with mm -hmm. that job of what you're going to do because you don't get to leave it. You can you can work for 30 years. You can get six figures, maybe even seven. Mm -hmm. 
But if you haven't taken what they're paying you and invested in something that you can leave, the job goes to the next person in line when you die, when you retire. Mm. True. And, yes. and so there's a big difference in how much you earn and how much you keep mm -hmm. and what you do with what you keep. You've said an awful lot so <laughs> far. And um, someone has uh, already left a, a sad crying face because of the things that you're saying. I guess they are shocked and um, you know just appalled by mm -hmm. the information that you just, just have given us so far. Um, why is it so difficult for Black families to build strong financial fi foundations for the future? Hmm. Okay, uh, that's a highly <laughs> complex question because it's multiple things. Number one mm -hmm. is you, you're talking about a breakdown of the family. If you talk to uh, people who have become famous because they're wealthy, yeah. uh, if you talk to them, and I've had the pleasure, I've in order to build this course, in order to learn, I've talked to, tapped into, interviewed, wrote, and received responses from a number of people. And like clockwork, one of the things they say that you never think about is marriage is a wealth hack. Mm -hmm. The problem yeah. is we've gone from 1960 when uh, the average black child was born into, well, 75% of black children were born into a two parent household to now 75% are born into a single parent household. Mm -hmm. We're also in a culture where it has become acceptable to procreate and move on. Mm -hmm. The problem is if I've got kids in four homes, it's hard for me to set up what I need to set up aside because I'm getting every, every, when I get paid, I'm just looking at it go. Yeah. Another thing is the average black person, because they have not experienced success, is looking for, whenever you have an idea of what success is, success is wealth because wealth provides everything else that you want for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't provide happiness, but you can do a lot of things with it to create and facilitate the happiness you want to create in your life. You definitely mm -hmm. can do that. But here's what happens when I can't have what they have because they control it and they only give me crumbs. And I sit up and I go, what I want to be successful and I want to experience it as a man. I want to experience my masculinity mm -hmm. the same way the white man does. But he does it through his wealth, his power. Yeah. Yeah. We tend to experience it through our athletic ability and through our physical prowess. And so we're limited in that area and what we can do with it. But what happens is the moment I get a chance to do something that I can at least appear to be successful in, I jump on it. It normally works against me. Mm. Blacks uh, are right now one hundred and fifty something, one hundred and sixty thousand dollars gap, one hundred and sixty something thousand gap. Medium wealth, median household wealth for whites is roughly around 177, 177. Mm -hmm. Median household wealth for blacks, depending on the study, around 17, mm -hmm. mm. 17,000. That's a big gap. But blacks spend $2 billion a year on Jordans. Between October and, and, and New Year's, we spend another whopping $573 billion. We spend mm -hmm. $42 billion for uh halloween another 45 50 billion for thanksgiving and a whopping yeah, yeah. 450 billion for christmas and, and and then despite that huge wealth gap we out buy mercedes by double we buy twice yeah. as many as mercedes as they buy why because mm -hmm. it's a symbol we yeah. can't have the real thing, but we're going to look good. We're going to, you know, we, we spend more time in Louis Vuitton than they do mm -hmm. because it's a symbol of success. We can't have mm -hmm. the real thing, but we want to portray that we've arrived. So it's real important for us to push the whip, to, to wear the bags, the Louis mm -hmm. Vuitton shoes, all the stuff, because, hey, that says I've arrived. We don't mm -hmm. realize how we're working against ourselves. So, so you got Dr. Rick. Yeah. It's, so. Well, what I'm hearing you say it, you, so that's a mindset thing that we have to address. Absolutely. Okay. Psychology is 80% of success in anything you do. 
You can have the best plan in the world, but if your mind isn't on straight, it doesn't matter. I'd rather take a person with the right mindset and no plan than mm -hmm. a person that's mind is all messed up with the best plan. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So, and uh, to trail cook, absolutely. That's what we need. We need to shift the mindset yes. mm -hmm. of how we think and how we approach um, using the term ignorance in its truest state, mm -hmm. the absence of knowledge, the absence yeah. of awareness. That thing is where we've got to start is I often say when I'm lecturing, when I'm speaking uh, is one of the biggest problems we have as a collective is we don't know how things work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are constantly taken advantage of because we simply don't know how things work. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't know how things work, people who do exploit you. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Um, that's real good. I'm just going to piggyback real quick. Now I'll let you go ahead with your next question. Um, even in my business, when I'm dealing with people's personal credit, some people don't even know what the consumer laws are. They don't even know that some of these things are violations that companies have just been doing these same things over and over again. But we have a, a right that says this doesn't even belong on your consumer report. Some some of my clients don't even know that your FICO score has it's not part of your consumer report. It helps build a score from the information, but it does it doesn't make your consumer report. And I think that, like you're saying, not having that knowledge and not having the understanding, we fall behind because. You, you gave the statistics. We're, we're leading in buying Jordans. I think yeah. we were last week. I was just saying, my household, we don't buy no product unless we own some stock in it. Wow. We're going to own, own some of it before we, we're purchasing because why just be the consumer? You know, you, you want to be able to own and seek reap the rewards of ownership. That's what they're doing. They're owning, they're buying. They, they're buying a great rate. They're taking out debt to go buy uh, assets and banking on life insurances to take care of those things at the end. So I think that's all I, I love what Dr. was saying. So John, you're saying that if we're going to be consumers of these different products, Nike, mm -hmm. Apple, um, we should also be invested or have some investment, um, some stock investment. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes, because because if you look at it, like you later said, I know around that time of year everybody's buying Jordans. But how many parents, as parents, do we or you have? Do you have stock in Nike? You have stock in Jordans, other brands, but you're spending two, three hundred dollars just so to say yes, your son has this or your daughter has this. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, just to keep up, like you're buying, we're buying the number one buyers of Mercedes. Why? Is that the best car? Or did somebody told you that was the best car? Right. It's, it, it's all symbolism. Um, yeah. and, and he makes a valid point. Um, one of the things that I try to teach my kids, and again, kids will ultimately do, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what they what they want to do. But uh, if the seed is planted, they will eventually find their way back to it once they realize their way what doesn't work most of the time. Uh, but uh, to, to, to the point that he's making is such a valid point. And I'm going to use myself as an example. I don't have all the answers to wealth. I've made mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, I've moved arrogantly because I was flowing good and it, it cost me and set me back. I, I've, 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 I've done it all. So everything isn't because I've got the plan and I'm just smooth, moving through life and got it all figured out. It's because I bumped my head and said, okay, I don't want everybody to come along and bump their head on this thing. So yeah. how I, I show. So, but uh, back when things were really going well and I had all these things going, one of the things that I loved was cars. My driveway was that, that place. I had a friend that I used to meet for lunch and she would say, I get so excited when we have lunch. I'm like, why? She said, I just want to see what you're going to pull up in. Mm. But here's the thing. I had this thing that if I'm going to have, and I had a couple of fetishes. I like shoes, I like caps, and I like cars. Mm -hmm. Everything that I had, I had a way of facilitating it. So I drove a lot of cars, but I had a car, a luxury car mm -hmm. leasing business. Uh, so I funded my fetish yeah. with a money-making opportunity that allowed me to do what I wanted to do. 
and make money. Same thing, like you said. Um, I have stock in Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm gonna have an iPhone, I gotta have some. Some I gotta have. Some, I gotta get something back. Yeah, <laughs> y'all killing me. Here, so I gotta get something back. And the thing is, you got, you always have to teach to ask the questions. We don't know the questions to ask. To by well, uh, there are four things that every freaking billionaire I talked to said. Number one, understand the cost of your investment. Mm -hmm. So they want to know what it's going to cost them. Number two, understand how much you stand to lose. Most people are looking for how much they can can make, how much they're going to make. The billionaire is looking for how much I'm going to lose. Number three, asymmetric risk risk reward. Well, the average person being told you got to invest a lot to get a little. The billionaires are looking for times where they can invest a little and get a lot. Okay, so... The, then the fourth one is diversity across assets. Don't put all your bags in one, one, one thing. But the thing is, you've got to know what it's going to cost you to do anything. And then you've got to be willing to understand. Again, it goes back to my thing. You got to understand how the game is played. One of the first things that I was told was understand the game and the rules of the game before you start to play or it will be a very expensive lesson. And, you know, so I I wasn't too hard headed, but ultimately we have to invest in knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's so hard for us. Number one is we'll go out and spend $1,200 on a purse. And then turn around and say, you want to charge me $500 for this class? Mm-hmm. You want to charge me $1,000? This class is going to pay you back over and over again what you put into it. That purse is going to depreciate in value. Mm-hmm. And you, the, even the emotional fix you're getting off of getting it is going to die. Yeah. And you're going to want another one. Mm-hmm. Well, if that's going to be your fix, wouldn't you want something coming in on a constant basis that allows you to have that without putting you in a bind? But then again that's that's good what you said because um a pastor friend of mine used to always say uh people will pay attention when they pay so Absolutely. When, like you like you're saying with the class thing me and my wife are bigger mentorship we take classes after class after classes because these people have been where we're trying to go so and then we pay because we know we're going to pay attention because we ain't going to just waste our money, you know? And I think that that's the thing that when you, when you, when you want to take these classes and you want to learn and go to the next level, you can't be afraid to pull out your, your money and pay to learn something, you know, just like when you talk about your books, I'm going to get your books. You got some knowledge in there that I need to learn. I got to buy the book. Mm-hmm. So I think that you're right. But I think that we, we have to be willing to not just to have the things as like the, the the shiny car ornament to say, oh, I got this new purse, like your, your example, but how did they manufacture that purse? Like, whoa, do you want to start a purse company? That's why you bought the purse to see how, how their whole business works. Like, we got to look at it just a little different to me. What I, I what I hear both of you saying that as as black folks, we need to um, learn to prioritize. Yeah. Prioritize our purchases um, and prioritize um, what we set our mindsets to. And as we, you know, are building this generational wealth. Um, so I want to ask you all what happened or what allowed you to become financially literate? Because I know this doesn't happen overnight. And I know the person just says, oh, I just want to get into, you know, um, financial literacy. What happened that made you wake up and say, let me help our Black people with um, building financial wealth? Talk, talk to us about that. John, you want to take it first? You want Okay. To go? I'll go first. Okay. Um, well, for me, it was just seeing the same over um, same situations in my family. Mm-hmm. Um, saying like, why, why there's no millionaires in my family? Why are we still, when someone passed away, 
we got to all get together to try to uh, have the friend group. Why didn't someone teach the older person, our, our uncles or aunts, about the importance of life insurance and not just leaving enough to bury, but enough to to make a legacy? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that was starting me off like, it's none now, but why can't I be the first? Mm. Then I got to my mindset, like, you know what? I have two sons. If it's not me, why can't it be them? So let me lay my foundation down, put things in order for them so they can have the structure so they can receive what I might not receive. And that's okay with me, but I want, it got to end somewhere with me. Past my, past me, my, my sons are going to be the ones who are going to be the millionaires, going to be successful, going to have the, the structure, going to have the things in order. And that's why I'm just really on this journey of get, trying to find education pieces, trying to um, study. And like you said, make mistakes too, but also um, learn from those things so they won't have to make. It's more about what I'm leaving for them, what I'm setting up for them, so they can have what I might not never see. It's like it's a it's a quote I like where it says that um, a wise man understands the importance of planting a tree they'll never he'll never see the shade of, mm. and I think that we have to have that mindset to think so far ahead. It is not about you. When it's not about you, it's it gives you peace because you're like you know what this is for my grandson that I haven't met yet. My sons are eleven and four, but I'm already thinking like okay. I have their structure, okay? Like you were saying about the Rockefellers, I read, I, I studied that because that's an amazing tool to understand how they did it. And we can still do it at our level. It is just not, don't, and I'm, I'm trying to say it the right way, don't be selfish and try to have everything to yourself. It, it might, you can have, you have to start where you're level at. When I first started investing for my sons when they were born, I think I was investing like $25 a week. Then as I, as, increases come, their stock has kept growing and growing, but I kept investing. So to the point where when they get 18, what I got at 18 was just congratulations, you graduate high school. <laughs> they're going to have something to build on. They're going to have great credit. They're going to have investments. They're going to have ownership. And we already started a, a business for them. So they're going to come out better than what I came out. So it just really, I wanted to change and see my sons take it and let them be the first millionaire if it's not me and my wife. Absolutely. That, that's that's awesome. And before I tell you what got me started, I got to commend him because something he said, it, it, it hinges on a principle that I push literally weekly. And it is that in order for blacks to actually advance, uh, to talk, we talk about liberation and empowerment all the time, but there's very little movement and progress because we don't understand uh, the manner of things work. One of the things I say, and it hinges on that that proverb that you mentioned, but I, I just said a different way. I say, mm -hmm. in order for us to progress, we're going to need black men who are willing to plant seeds that they may not live long enough to see come to fruition. And what that means is our children, our offspring, our progeny, our youth. If I'm pouring into three, four, five year olds, and I do, I have uh, something you said in your introduction got me excited because I have a program called Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage initiative for young black males that teaches them all these things because we've got this big gap of absentee men in our community. So we do that. But the thing is, you have to pour into them, then you have to insulate them because what happens in the average in the in in in, in the average sense is Every parent has to socialize their child. In other words, you're smart, you're beautiful, you can do anything you want to do, you can, you're going to do great, blah, blah, blah. A black parent is is is, is dubbed with having to regularly, so, the, the regular general socialization, they don't have to racially socialize them. You're going to have to be three times smarter than the average person that you're, you're competing against for a job. You're going to have to do this. They're going to tell you that you're ugly. They're going to tell you that your hair is not pretty. They're going to tell you that your nose is too wide. And all these things, but you are absolutely gorgeous and you can do anything you want. To. You got to do these things because they're going to go out there and immediately when they leave that home, they're going to meet a world that's going to undo everything you told them if you don't anchor them well. Well, here it is at my age, if I'm working and I'm sewing in the kids that are three, four, five, 10, 11, by the time it really sinks in, I may not be here, but I've got to care enough about the future 
that I'm that 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 you know because my kids are going to live in it, their kids are going to live in it, and so forth. What am I building, and what am I teaching them? How I got started in it was, I was I was reared by my great grandparents. My grandmother's parents reared me. So my grand my great grandfather was a son of a sharecropper, born in 1909, second grade education, but he worked and took care of his family, and he ultimately ended up. Uh, becoming a master welder, returning, retiring after 30 years. She owned her own beauty salon. So I had it around me. They were very responsible with their spending. We were nowhere close to being wealthy or rich, mm -hmm. but we were lower middle class blacks in a poor neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we were, you know, people would look at us and thought we were rich because lights never got turned off. We never had to worry about food. N none of that stuff. The house was paid for. But immediately leaving, I met someone, and I'll be honest with you, a Jewish guy sitting at a bar watching a game. He looked over at me and asked me a question, and the answer I gave him intrigued him. He said, well, I'm going to give you two books. You read those books. Here's my card. Call me when you read. I read the books in a week, called him back. He said, you haven't read those books. I said, yes, I have. I'm an avid reader. When you write as many books as I've written, you've got to have, you've got to have read a lot. But he started teaching me and he mentored me. He taught me the basics of business, the basics of finance. He mm -hmm. even told me this and then I'll pass it back to him. He even told me, he said, you, you, you have this renegade mentality about you. You don't want to be compliant about anything. You're not going to fit regularly into society because you don't want to wear a suit. You're extremely smart, but you don't want to wear a suit. Can't get that cap off your head to save your life. You don't want to wear number T-shirts and jeans and, and everything like that. And the thing is, I'll put a suit on. I clean up nicely, but that's just not me. I'm me. And I'm me whether I'm wearing a suit or not. So when I put the suit on, I make the suit. The suit don't make me. Yes. Uh, Because what happens is if you take my suit from me, if my identity is in my suit, if it's in my car, if it's in the house I live in and you take it from me, I'm empty. But if I know who I am and it's inside of me, you can take all that. I'm still standing. Why? Because I'm the person that built it. I'll build it again. Yes. So anyway, he said up, he told me, he said, the problem is nobody's going to want to let you in to, to hear all this stuff you got and to see all this stuff you got. He said, but there's one key. And I said, what is it? He said, he who has the gold makes the rules. Say it again. He who has the gold makes the rules. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? He said, if you got what they want and you're delivering it in a way that they can't get it anywhere else, you can walk in there butt naked. They'll figure out a way to deal with you to get it. And I've watched that. I've watched that culture where I've walked in the boardrooms. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a T-shirt and some jeans and sneakers or loafers or whatever, but definitely not in a suit and tie. And they you know, kind of feel a little uncomfortable. Everybody's in there dressed to the T. And we get through, we finish, and we have another meeting. And, and then what I start watching is as the meetings progress, the, casual, the casualness of how they're dressing changes. Now they're in polo shirts and khakis. What happened to the suits? The bottom line is you break down barriers by bringing value to the table and being yourself. And I have nothing against suits. I wear them, but they don't make me. And so, but that's what got me is my grandparents set me up. Look, we're giving you every chance we got. We're going to get you started, but you got to take it to the next level. And, and my grandfather always gave me this responsibility. He said, son, you're going to be in three places in life, going into a storm, in a storm or coming out of one. That's life. Don't try to dodge it. Don't try to get around. It. It's going to happen. He says, your number one responsibility as a man is to make sure you come out of the storm better than the man that went in. If you do that, you won't have to chase greatness. It'll overtake you. And so that's what I've spent my life doing, just letting the storm shape me, not letting it destroy me. And then sharing it with as many people as I can. This is good stuff. Thank you, gentlemen. Again, I want to ask, why does black wealth matter? Because there are certain conversations on um, Twitter um, and there I see that there are a lot of people that do not understand why our wealth matters. Um. 
I think it matters because it helps us shape our community. I think it, you know, it was a time where we owned all the stores in our community. We own, um, I can remember it, my grandfather taking me to a bob shop that his that his his uh, friend owned when I was two three years old, and then not only did we leave there, his other friend owned the uh, car the car auto place on the corner. Then we go get a sub from the, his sister or somebody who owns that. So I think that's that's the part of it that we have to have back ownership of our communities. I think and I think that by building generational wealth that helps. It, start, it has to start somewhere. So if you're leaving um, businesses, you're leaving um, uh, property so that the next generation can have it. So I think it's to help out build our communities. Because then we, when, we, when we're in those, we're in our communities and we have we're ownership of everything, then we can dictate our school system. We can dictate what gets being taught. And I think so, that's the thing, like, because. I didn't learn none of this stuff until I got out and started like just start reading books and earn and learning the difference. Like, wow, wow, I was never taught in school because you're taught in school just to work for someone and not be the owner, you know. So I think that that's the way we want to take back our communities and we want to structure how we want to best advance our children. I'm I'm glad you brought up those points because that was the major argument. Um, that we can never keep anything for long mm -hmm. periods of time. So thank yep. you for that. Dr. Rick? Uh, I, I think it's important to understand how things work. We're back to that same thing, because when you yeah. understand how things work, then you understand the importance of wealth. Wealth is power. Um, we hang our hats on a bunch of different things and we'll get, we become frustrated when those things don't work out. Uh, we rally the black vote, but don't understand that without the economic power, to influence the politicians, the vote really doesn't matter because there are people immediately after you vote them in contributing to their PACs, contributing to their lobbies, contributing to those things that actually influence the decisions and they're gonna move with the money. The money is always gonna move the politician, local, state and federal levels. But more importantly, what John touched on, if I own in my community I'm contributing towards the things that influence my children. Uh, if I own in the community, number one is the quality of life is directly associated with your level of wealth, yeah. your health. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, in my study, it's revealed in two books that I wrote. My 19th book is Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. And my 22nd book is The Undoing of the African-American Mind. And I talk about epigenetics and the influence on uh, our psychology, sociology, epigenetics, and the influence on our physiological health and the healing of trauma. And what we have come to learn is that there's an epigenetic influence to our overall health outcomes. Matter of fact, there's a new section of uh, that I've really gotten involved in. I'm actually doing a workshop for Harris County Sheriff's Department uh, next weekend uh, where I'll be actually working with families who are suffering with this, but mm -hmm. adverse childhood experiences and the long-term health implications. People think trauma, okay, it's a mental thing, but it's playing out in our health. Epigenetically, it's influencing gene performance. Mm -hmm. So if I'm stressed out because I can't pay the bills, I'm shortening my life. I'm increasing my risk for ischemic heart disease. I'm increasing my risk for type 2 diabetes. I'm increasing my risk for autoimmune diseases like lupus uh, and cancer. A vast majority of cancers we're not starting to find out are actually being influenced by level environmental stress. Mm. And I've actually been invited to lecture twice uh, at the International Conference for Epigenetics and Cancer because my research was about uh, multi-generational trauma. Because everybody's talking about, it's been a hundred and something years and you're still talking about slavery. Well, let's talk about how we got here. And so that's how it started for me. So what happens is when you can pay your bills, when you can sit up and say, okay, I need a break and not have to go ask your boss for a week off. When all these little microaggressions that actually work to harm us internally, uh, physiologically are, are good enough. But then when I can sit up and tell my kid, this is the thing. 
Do you realize that a significant portion of the white population, when their kids get out of school and get ready to start their careers, they fund their start? They seed money, their first house purchase? That, I mean, I'm talking 50 to $100,000 on the house. You, we like get out there. So that what John said earlier about it can't just be me taking what I earn and doing me. I got to think about the future of my kids. That's what that means. So when you have generational wealth, what you actually have when it's functioning right is I'm living off the wealth that was given to me. What I'm building belongs to them. And that's the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to be building something that's getting bigger and you're passing it down. So every generation has it easier than you had it. Mm. And imagine if instead of telling a kid, well, you should start your own business. Well, how? Well, they're not funding uh, us the way they're funding them. So you're not going to go get traditional loans the way you think you're going to not have access the way they do. So what are you going to do? If I can fund my own business, if I can look at what's going on, if I can tell my son, look, whatever you want to do, I got it. Just go do it. Bring the business plan. We're going to sit down. We're going to go over it. We're going to break it down. We're going to do a marketing analysis. We're going to get all this stuff together. We're going to figure it out. We're going to make it happen. Then he doesn't have to go ask somebody for it. He has it. And that power is what we need to experience as a people. Number two, that same power is the very force that we use to underwrite our displeasure and intent. I tell people all the time, the reason nobody pays attention when we protest is because we have no economic force or power behind it mm. to actually execute any type of economic sanction. So what we, what we have with, with no economic power and we go protest about something, it's nothing more than a collective temper tantrum. And that's what they do. When your three-year-old is cutting up and throwing, you look at them, lay on the floor and keep right on walking. Why? Can't do nothing to me. You being mad don't bother me. So you go, but if that protest is the precursor to we're about to take our money out of your economy, we're about to stop buying here. We're about to build something over here for ourselves and we won't need you for this anymore. Then all of us say, oh Lord, they're getting mad. Let's go over here and do something. Let's see what's wrong. Let's and but nobody's gonna care if you're mad if you can't do it. This we also have this uh idea that everybody carries the same level of um uh, commitment to morality that we do. We tend to believe that we can convince them just how horrible they're treating us and they're gonna change. You don't think they know. That's that's smart. You don't think they know what they're doing. This world doesn't operate on morality. Everybody wants to believe it operate. It operates on consequence. Mm -hmm. If you want to control somebody's behavior, apply a consequence to the behavior you don't like. When you don't like something that there's a negative consequence to it, you will stop seeing it because they don't want it. Most people are behaving because they don't want to go to prison. Not because they are this good, these good people. Most people haven't walked up and banged your car up that, that that in the neighborhood you live in that don't like you because they are good people. They know they're going to get charges pressed against them. Same thing economically. If you're going to hurt my bottom line, I got to pay attention to what you're saying. Why do you think everybody flipped out when Kanye did what he did? Mm -hmm. Because the Jews know how to rally their dollar. Exactly. Point blank, point simple. It is, so it, nobody, nobody's even thinking about anti-Semitism. Yeah. People are thinking about, man, these people start pulling levels on us. And, 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 and they have that force and that power. Instead of sitting up and being envious of it, build your own. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, guys. Um, there are questions coming in, so I need to get to these questions, audience questions. Um, the first question is, Dr. Rick, can you drop a link to give us um, more information about how listeners can purchase your book? Uh, let's see. I could put it in the private chat to you, and I guess you can give it to him. Yes, I will do okay. that. Um, so I'm going to start the questions while you do that. Um, okay. we'll move on to the next question. Um, three practical tips to transition to beginning to the beginnings of building 
generational wealth. So give us three practical tips to transition into the beginnings of building generational wealth. You want to take it, Johnny? Okay. Um, number one, you, you definitely have to look at your situation. You got to be mindful of where you're at and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, number two, I will say that pick what avenue you want to try to leave for um, the next generation and build upon that. And number three, you got to have a structure that you're leaving for them so that it won't fall by the wayside. Thank you for that. Okay. Here's what I would do. Exactly what he said. And, 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 and uh, one thing that actually ties into what he does is the first thing that I would tell people, start reducing your debt. Mm -hmm. um, reducing your debt because the number one enemy to wealth is debt. When you hear people talking about net worth, what a person's net worth is all of their assets in whatever form they are, hard, liquid or whatever, and subtracting their debt and expenses. And that you have their net worth, what they're worth after you subtract their debt. So you reduce your debt, you automatically increase wealth. Number two, indexing. Index, 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 compound growth. We, mm -hmm. we do it backwards all the time. And all it is is investing in what is uh, known as an index fund, which is a passively mm -hmm. ma managed mutual fund, uh, the, the Vanguard S&P 500. Yeah. Five, prime example. Uh, it's producing on the low end, 8.2, regularly 10% compounded annually. Mm -hmm. Okay. The earlier you get your kids involved in this, the better off they are. Because the earlier you get, the longer your compounding mechanism is working. Now, most people are actually operating on the reverse side of that. And that is they are compounding debt. Your mm -hmm. home is compounding debt annually. Mm -hmm. uh, your auto, automobile loan is compounding debt. And so it's working against you. But all you're doing is you can go to any compound calculator on the inter Internet type in, I'm going to put in X amount of dollars a month and say, or put in how much you want to make in 20 years, how much you want to have in your reserve in 20 years, and then play with the numbers. And it'll tell you how much you got to give a month based mm -hmm. on uh, an average uh, return. And the Vanguard has been doing yeah. consistent. <laughs> now, you're obviously going to have these variations, but the problem is most people panic in the stock market. Worst thing you can do. Uh, Ray Dalio uh, said that the stock market is the only place where people panic when something goes on sale. And for mm -hmm. an investor, when you have a, a, a bear market or you have a market correction on the downside yeah. where things, the, the stock prices are dropping, mm -hmm. uh, crisis investors are licking their chops. Yeah, that's the And time. I actually <laughs> learned this by just asking the question. Remember I said, we don't ask questions. Yeah. I actually learned this by asking a question. When I first started looking at the stock market, like, like I learned, I was like, don't play the game until you know the rules. So I'm, I'm looking at it. I ain't in yet. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. And I would hear, okay, stock prices are crashing and everybody's selling off. There's this big sell-off, right? And I'm going, okay, if the stock prices are dropping and people are selling because the stocks are dropping, Who's the dummy buying these? Mm. Actually, that's the genius. Yeah. Because they understand how the stock market works. There's going to always be market corrections on both sides. Mm -hmm. When you over over uh, state, you're going to have this inflation that you're going to call it a bloom, a bubble, whatever. Mm -hmm. And eventually the market corrects. It goes down. And then the market tends to overcorrect. So eventually the, uh, the real rates or, or prices come back up. And you don't realize a loss in the stock market until you sell. Yeah. If I own a hundred shares and the price in the shares start to drop, I haven't lost money yet. Mm -hmm. Now, if I sell while it's dropped, then I've lost That's whatever I lost sell. Money. Yep. Right. What I should have done is do my homework and know what I'm investing in and trust that that mm -hmm. company is going to rebound when the rest of the economy rebounds. Mm -hmm. I'm holding. That day trading stuff will get you every time. So, <laughs> but indexing is where you want to get. Then the next thing is research, uh, research trust. Mm -hmm. Trust 
will protect you because most people think all you need is a will. Yeah, a will is good until one person in your family decides to challenge it. Mm. Yeah. Now, hello, probate. But I had a will. But but dummy over there decided to challenge it. Now everybody's sitting around waiting. But if you put everything in a trust and it's an irrevocable trust, that trust dictates what happens to that money even after you're gone. So it controls. That's how they pass down wealth. If you, uh, another Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller once said, the goal is to own nothing and control everything. Yeah. And I'm like, what the heck? So here I go. Why? I ask questions. Mm -hmm. Go look. What he's saying is everything that I have that's mine doesn't have my name on it. Mm -hmm. It's in a trust. In the trust. So even if you come after me and sue me, you don't get that because it's not mine. It's the trust. Mm -hmm. It's it's the again, the things you don't know are what is is harming you. It's put it in a trust, mm -hmm. learn how to use the trust, and mm -hmm. then the trust controls what happens to the man after you go. You say, Well, those kids gonna squander it. No, mm -hmm. now, everybody laughs and talks about uh trust kids, but those parents knew, man, if I leave this kid this money within a certain amount. And then you look up and go, how is Paris Hilton still living off of her trust? Because it's a trust. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, 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 and so she can do it. She, but she can't override the trust. Mm -hmm. And the trust is designed and built to make sure it's dummy proof. Mm. And you have people who do this and set these things up so that you don't have to know it all, but you need to know enough. Even when it comes to business. And, uh, and and I'm sharing this with you, John, and anybody else that's talking about business. Mm -hmm. uh, while incorporating is a great way to go, I've incorporated, uh, you know, the low, lower side of incorporation, the LLC, limited liability, mm -hmm. corporation, C corps to corporate so that you can house your company. The problem is with incorporation is they'll do that's dual taxality. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a thing called an unincorporated business trust, mm -hmm. uh, also known as a Massachusetts trust that doesn't have dual taxation and the rs literally hates it but it's legitimate you just got to make sure it's structured right and that when money is paid out to an individual the individual pays the taxes on it. Yeah. but other than that you can run your business everything through there and as long as it's an expense you can spend money out of the trust to pay for the expense and it's not taxed mm. so all that but see that's what they know already yeah. And we're over here and we don't know it. And so we're moving around and it's important for us to have our name on it. First thing, it ain't, it ain't in your name. I don't care if it's in my name. Do I control it? Yeah. You know, do I have, I mean, but that's how we're built. So it's in my name. And then every time you look up, you're easy target. Mm. Wow. Something's in your name, you're easy target. You fool around and have a rough year. Everybody comes after you. If it's in your name, they can not only come after your company, they can come after you. Mm -hmm. your personal assets that's why you have these different levels so all that's important but yeah research trust would be the third indexing would be the second and re reducing debt would be the first if i was going to take a three-prong approach to getting started thank you for that um how does home ownership contribute to wealth building okay i think that's important like we, we talked about earlier about controlling the community, because the more ownership, or only home ownership in a community, you see more things should be getting passed down to the next generation. Um, even take it to another level, um, having like teaching youth how to what's the importance of home ownership. Like instead of going after that first dream house that you're trying to buy, buy a duplex. You know, before you get married, you know, you and your fiance, both y'all buy one. And y'all let those things, those properties pay for the dream house that you want. So home ownership is a great way to pass on generational wealth. Um, you can you can use that to um, supplement income. You can take from it from it to build something else to pay off debt. You can roll you can roll debt into the home mm -hmm. while you start your business or doing other adventures. I think that that's a, a great way. We definitely have to increase the home ownership we definitely have to definitely have to understand the the power of having it and um taking back 
the community, like even like um, if you go to some areas that you know in, in a city, you see these ran down homes. And I live in I live in Maryland, so like a lot in Baltimore City, it's a lot of ran down homes and stuff like that. Even buying those properties right now and holding them, it's a good way because you don't know what's going to come through next. John Hopkins could come by the next block, and you got the homes, and they come into you. Hey, we want to buy this area. So you see that a lot is about when you buy and how long you're willing to hold to see a return. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, however, we have to get our millennials and those mm -hmm. that come after the millennials in that mindset, because right now the mindset is apartment living. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a big trend right now. I don't know if you all know this, but that is a big mm -hmm. trend since, um, you know, apartments have gone up. Have the, Well, um, it has increased since the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. What do you say on that, Dr. Rick? I think you you, you make a valid point. Uh, there's a trend on that. And I, I don't think that it's by accident. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to understand that ideas, thoughts and collective movement is controlled by the media mm -hmm. messages and propaganda set mindsets mm -hmm. uh, if you tell enough people enough time that this is the cool thing to do they tend to do it mm -hmm. and uh it comes with all these amenities and you don't have to worry about paying the lawn guy <laughs> you don't have to worry about getting this fixed and getting mm -hmm. that fixed. all the little things of apartment living that makes it convenient mm -hmm. but how much is it costing you? And that's the question that everybody has to learn to ask themselves about every financial decision and putting a roof over your head is a financial decision. Yeah. So you have to learn how to ask yourself, what is it costing me in the long term? Mm. You know, I learned to ask myself, OK, man, I, I want that Breitling watch. But how mm. much will that Breitling watch cost me? over the course of 10 years? And so I'm like, what do you mean? You paid the 5,000 for it, dude, and it's yours. <laughs> no, that 5,000 is coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if I take that same 5,000, put it in that same index account with 10% return interest, how much did I lose by buying that watch? Because the watch is, it's, it's a valuable watch. So it's going to hold some value. It'll have some value, but it won't be the 5,000 I spent on it. And it won't be the 70, 7,800 or the 2,000, depends over 10 years, how much I'm going to make on that if I put that money in, in an interest bearing uh, uh, account or a stock with that's returning uh, a good return on it. So again, you have to ask yourself, what is this um, apartment costing me? The home ownership is important again, because it allows you to control your destiny. It's also a place mm. worth value, but more importantly, the property on which the house sits is the mm. value. Mm -hmm. It's the value. You got mineral rights. You got air rights. You got all these things you buy with property. Nobody ever explains to you. It's in the writing, but you have all of that. Mm. And if you're smart, like, for instance, if you ever go to a hotel, 90% of hotels don't own the building. They own the managerial rights. Mm -hmm. Someone else owns the building. So two people are getting paid from one endeavor. But 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 if you don't understand it, then there are air rights. You literally control what goes over your head if you know how to execute air rights. You can say, I don't want anything mm. flying over my property unless you pay me a licensing fee. Mm. If you buy, I mean, you wow. literally have that when you buy the property, but we don't understand that. So we tend to look at things as, well, I've got a house. Yeah, that's your roof. But you've got control. And the problem is we don't know to hold on to it. We surrender those things without understanding the value in them. I just mm. want to shout out my dad because he talks about this um, with my brother and I in his various conversations as far as the importance of um, ownership of land. Um, he did <laughs> explain to me, I remember years ago, he told me about, you know, what flies over you. You have some sort of control. So shout out to my dad for um you know, letting us know this and, you know, shout out to you, Dr. Rick, for echoing what my father um, did mention um, to me years ago. Um, my next question, well, the audience's next question is, why is it important that we know our credit score and is it linked no. to our financial freedom? Well, it's, it's real important to know your credit score because, um, it helps determine the rates that you will get if you're buying anything. Um, and this is linked to your financial future because having a good credit score will save you thousands and thousands of interest. 
and then it will open doors up for you um, with banks. Banks are looking at it like, okay, is this person trustworthy to pay us back? And banks are looking to give you the money, especially when you move on to the business side of using your, you can use your personal credit to help fund your business if you want to go that route, if you're just starting your business. And you tend to get 10 times more if you have a good credit score, you go get some business business credit. And then you're hiding that because you can put the stuff in your business name. So your business could be paying your rent. Like if you if you use certain if you use your home, for example, your apartment, for example, for a certain amount of time with your business, you can use you can pay it through your business. You, you write it off. So it's very important to know your credit score, what makes a good credit profile, because that's what the um you get your uh not the banner score, advanced score is that's that's you don't want that the FICO score comes from what's on your consumer report. And when your consumer report is, is showing the right thing, showing history, showing you're paying things on time, showing uh, uh, how much um, other banks have lent you, it helps them to go ahead and um, give you higher limits. Like, because if you if you know what to do with, if a bank gives you for your credit score, like Navy Federal is known for giving high credit limits. If you have a good enough score, Navy Federal will give you $25,000 credit card and you, you first time you open an account with them. Now, if you know what to do with that, it could change your life. But if you don't know what to do with that, you'll just be shopping to be a consumer and paying them back. So it's it's definitely important to know the credit score and how important how banks see you. So if banks see you as trustworthy, they are willing to give you the bag in a sense. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh he, he's exactly on point. There are a couple of things. There's one other thing I'm going to add to it, but a couple of things that I want to kind of piggyback on is um, when he's talking about your credit score and access. To me, the thing I focus on is there's good debt and bad debt. Mm -hmm. Getting a loan out to start your business to me is good debt. Yeah. Because you're investing in something that if it works out for you, it brings money back to you. Mm -hmm. buying a car is bad debt it is but it's in many instances for the average person it's necessary if you live in houston it's absolutely necessary unless you're able to pay cash for a car i i stopped buying new cars when i got rid of my luxury car leasing business you know eventually stuff runs of course not many people doing it as it used to and okay wait a minute starting to cost money time to let it go but uh so I don't, I look for a cash vehicle, you know, uh, and then I'm going to ride it till the wheels fall off. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm currently in a Range Rover and it's on the last run. It's like, you know, it's like, please put me up. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you got about two more months in you, player. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Because, but uh, if I can, if I can do, if I can go and not have to buy it, I'm going to buy a used one, a nice one, but used. Uh, number one is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kill a lot of the depreciation in what I'm purchasing. If I purchase a new vehicle, I'm probably getting a 40 percent depreciation in value within the first month of that owning that vehicle. It's just going to literally the moment I drive it off the lot, it's going to go from being an 80, what, an 80, 90,000, whatever, 40,000 dollar car, whatever, to down to being half, what, a little over half the price. It just is. Some cars hold that value more than others. But if you can sit up and do it now, if I'm investing in a business, I'm saying I'm investing in something that's actually going to pay me back. So ultimately, I'll actually have what I'm investing in pay back the loan I got. So I don't really actually have a liability if I if I if I capitalize. The other side of this that very few people ever talk about and the most important side to me is there are people that will pull your credit to determine your character. And mm -hmm. while anything can happen to anybody, I've had my ride on that credit wheel. But I go hard. So, you know, I'm expecting to have bumps in, in, in setbacks because I don't play. I'm, go, I'm out here to win. Uh, so there's good times, bad times. But people will pull your credit report to see the type of person you are. 
Now, I don't personally agree with that because I know a lot of people who are good people mm -hmm. who just can't seem to get over the hump or are good people bad with money. Yeah. So it's not a good judgment, but there are people who will do it. Jobs will pull your credit to determine whether they're going to hire or not. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get it taken care of, get your debt, uh, get your debt under control. Uh, if you got a lot going on, hire somebody to do it. I have somebody who manages mine. Mm -hmm. because, like They'll come and say, hey, did you pay so-and-so and so? I'm saying, I'm pretty sure I did. Don't be pretty sure. Could you check, please? You know, because they are literally, they're getting alerts on a regular basis. They have my credit set up to where they get alerts on a regular basis because mm -hmm. they're trying to get me somewhere. The thing is, I've learned how not to need it because I create ways to fund what I want. Uh, and, and that's another thing. I teach people how to do that online. Go online, create ways to earn money online. Uh, the program I got, the course that I'm launching Monday, A to Z. But again, that credit, why it's credit, credit scares me because the average person, when you get their credit where it's supposed to be, if they haven't learned finance, they're going to screw it up again because most people who are there in a bad place is because they're bad with money. And until you fix the bad with money thing, fixing the credit is the back end. And uh, the best credit repair people are the people who, while repairing your credit, are teaching you what you did wrong to put it there and not to do it again. So at least, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to learn, but at least, you know, because here's your outline. This is what you did. Don't do that no more. This is going to be a hard question <laughs> or maybe a hurtful answer. Mm -mm. How should I store my cash? Should I save it in a safe? Should I save it under the couch or the bed? Should I save it in envelopes? Talk to us about that. Yeah, this is going to be a hurtful one. Whoever that is, I love you. Yes. If you're about to catch smoke. Yes. Send the smoke, please. Save it in buying stock. Save it in investing in index funds. Save it by investing in business endeavors. Save it by buying art. And, in, and then uh, save it by buying art and then insuring the art. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that in a second. Whatever you do, don't save cash. I, I said it earlier. Cash is devaluing at a rapid rate. It's simply a fiat. You got to understand how cash or currency came to be. It all cash, all cash is, is a promissory note for something else of value. And what America started doing was printing cash with nothing to back it. It all started with a locksmith storing people's gold and giving them sheets of paper saying, this is how much gold you have with me. And they start negotiating that paper instead of carrying the bricks. And that's how this started. And then, you know, now thousands of years later, you got currency. But invest in something. Do you realize that the wealthy, nobody ever wonders why the wealthy are always at art auctions buying art? I, I learned this, again, just by paying attention and asking questions. 1984, I'm in high school, and uh, Eddie Murphy has a movie called Trading Places, where these two white billionaire brothers have this argument. You're either born with it or it's environment. Uh, or born with it or environment. And they had, so they kidnapped Eddie Murphy, put him in an environment to see who was right. And when they first did it, he's in the mansion and he wakes up and he's in this huge mansion. He just starts shoving stuff in his in his coat. And they say, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. It's yours. He said, wait a minute. It's all mine. He said, so if I pick up this vase and I throw it down and break it and, and one of the brothers, he breaks the vase and one of the brothers go, that was a 50. We paid $50,000 for that vase. Eddie, Eddie Murphy does this and other brothers, but we insured it for 70. And so I said, wait a minute. They buy art at auctions 
have it valued or appraised at higher rates, insure it for the higher rate, and now they're sitting on it. That do you know a bunch of that stuff is not even on the wall, it's in safes and storage places in different places. It's how they're hiding their wealth. They the the average millionaire in America drives a Toyota. The number one car driven by a millionaire in America is a Toyota. And the average millionaire does not have a million dollars in the bank. The average millionaire has a million in assets. They've invested it in things that hold value or grow in value. Uh, precious metals, uh, futures, oil, stock. Um, you've got to get out of the idea that cash is where your wealth is. Cash is liquid and it's the most vulnerable thing you can have to, to represent your wealth. I'll give you an example of something that ultimately will happen. When? I don't know. But there are a lot of people talking about real soon. Okay, let's just say the dollar is actually worth the dollar. It's not. It's not even worth 50 cents. But it's uh, of when we first started this thing. But let's just say the dollar is worth an actual dollar. So you've got a dollar under your mattress. You've been saving it. And all of a sudden, everybody calls in their markers in the U.S., for its debt, for everything. And it can't produce the gold or the assets to back the amount of currency it has out there. The dollar crashes. Now you take that dollar and try to go buy something with it and you can't. Why? Because inflation has just killed your dollar. And so that's why you don't keep cash. Because pay your bills and then take as much as you need and to, to do little thing, but I mean, I, you don't have something you can liquidate quickly. If you got to get to act. stocks can be liquidated pretty quickly, as long as you want to liquidate it during the hours that the stock market is open. You can normally sell off and, 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 and do that. Uh, other things you can, you know, I put my situations, things where I can't because this is long term for me. And I I'd rather get through what I'm getting through now and do what I'm doing long term and make sure my family's okay than to constantly be playing with their future. But but whatever you do, don't have no money in no envelopes. Don't have no money under the mattress. It, it's people right now that put $50,000 under their mattress in the 60s. It's worth about 5000 now. And you say, well, well it's $50,000. Yeah, but it only buys $5,000 of what that... Uh, of what could have been bought back then. So in essence, the price, a lot of things that we're seeing prices go up on is it isn't because of the normal supply and demand thing that we normally say, okay, price is going up because there's a high demand and low inventory. Mm -hmm. Prices are going up now because the value of the dollar sucks. Thank you for that. Last audience question, does mm -hmm. generational wealth transfer only during times of death you want to take oh you, you want me to go um i'll let you go then i'll, I'll piggyback off that you you go to roll <laughs> uh yes it can generational wealth can be passed down while you're living again through trust say for instance i've got trust for my kids so i'll use my nine-year-old that's the youngest my oldest is 37 uh my youngest is nine my nine year old has a trust at age 25 depending either age 21 or 25 depending on the number of stipulations she will receive that whether i'm alive or dead so it can be passed down while you're living it doesn't require you to die because you got to keep in mind that the wealth you're building to pass down isn't yours so you shouldn't have to die for them to get it they shouldn't have to be sitting sitting around waiting no i wish this he just doesn't even have the decency to die. You know, you know, you know, you don't want your family looking at you that way. So it shouldn't be dependent upon that. But that's how we think. So, you know, that's how we think. Like, you know, well, I'm going to hold all this stuff. For what? You know, take care of what you need to take care of. Create what's theirs when they reach a certain point of maturity. And, you know, and however you have it set up, they get it. So they should be living their lives off of what you created for them before your life is over. 
Thank you. John? I, I, I just agree. I, got, <laughs> I really agree with what you're saying. I'm, I'm very excited just to to hear the wealth of knowledge that you're that you're bringing out, it's like like I said in the beginning, I'm at the beginning stage of doing that for my family and laying the foundation. I, I disagree with that. The it's important not- thing, the important thing I want to share with John is I have you sitting here, black man to black man. Mm-hmm. Where you're at is a beautiful place. I admire you. Uh, I hold you up. Make uh, she's gonna make sure you got my information. You reach out to me. Anything I can help you with, I can help you with. Mm-hmm. But there's there's this old saying, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of it. Don't despise meager beginnings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when I started. I remember my first book. I remember the first company. I remember my first dream. And all you're looking at now is 35 years of somebody chasing it. Mm-hmm. And so you want to lay that foundation for your children. That it's going to be rough. And, and, and I'm saying that don't shield those rough moments from them. Don't let it hit them hard. Don't let them see all the stuff you go through, but let them know, hey, Mm -hmm. everything ain't easy. Daddy just doing it this way. But let them feel that, okay, it's going to get tough sometimes, but I'm going to get through it. And be a representation of what you want to see them become. Mm -hmm. Because kids are going to look at you. It's not what you're telling them. It's what you're modeling Mm -hmm. that's going to have the greatest impact. So, you know, you're saying, well, I'm just at the, no, that's a beautiful place to be. You know how many Mm -hmm. black men aren't even building the foundation yet? Yeah. Mm. And so you're at a place right now to hear you talk about it and be that and and speak confidently when you talk about it, because you Mm -hmm. got something inside of you right now that you need to be sharing with other brothers, because this thing has to take off. Yeah. And I hold you up as an older brother. I hold you up because that's something we don't do either. Mm-hmm. We're so busy trying to prove we're better than the next brother because they've taught us how to compete with one another. Yeah, I'm not in competition with you. I'm trying to love on you and help you get to where you want to get because I want to see the next generation do better than this generation. So when you say I'm at the foundation, square your shoulders and say it because you are doing something that a bunch of us aren't doing. I thank you, John, for sharing your experiences with us, being vulnerable and saying, I am new to this. I thank you, Dr. Rick, for upholding our brother, John, and for praising him for for being at the stage that he is at at this point in life. I thank you that you guys are um, showing Black men a different side of um, that you all don't have to compete with each other and that you all are there to hold each other up as well as on John's part, he's there to learn. So I appreciate the Mm -hmm. transparency that you all are showing from this conversation. And this is our time, but before we go, tell our listeners how they can connect with you, starting with Dr. Rick. Uh, The easiest way to connect with me is to email uh, my support team, which is life change at rick wallace phd dot link uh and they can answer any questions about any of the things we have going on including the courses the books or anything else um that's the easiest way awesome thank you john how can they connect with you well the easiest way to connect with me is um through insta through instagram at the premier credit builder um i have a link tree with um with my website with more information um, you can reach out for a free consultation through my link tree. Awesome. Thank you for highlighting your experiences and expertise for doing your part and changing the narrative. And lastly, for keeping your commitment by being a part of the show that means a lot to us. Um, I want to thank our listeners um, today for being patient. This conversation took a little bit longer Thank you for being engaged. Thank you for your questions. If you all enjoyed the show, please let us know if you or someone you know is changing the narrative. Please contact us at any of our on any of our platforms. We would love to share your story. And don't forget to follow us on TikTok and IG as we are growing at I Change the Narrative. For merch, visit ichangethenarrative.org. Thank you to our sponsors, So Organic, So Swab. You can follow Sauce on Instagram. For the latest in product news and updates, visit at www.sossd.c 
oh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. I changed the narrative. That's all one word. We've added a weekday pop-up. We'll see you next time. Same place for more great show, more great conversation. Thank you all so much for listening. I appreciate you all.